a lot of organizations are struggling to get a comprehensive data strategy right. The future of information technology is likely to be in the cloud. I want to bring the discussion uh, into a dive deep on why the adoption of cloud technology can be advantageous when it comes to information security. And then I think we are going to dive a bit deeper about all the foundational pillars of data protection, and we will look specifically at how encryption and confidential computing work in the cloud and what are the opportunities for organizations. Welcome to talk.cybercni.fr. Welcome to 2023. Welcome to the 26th edition of Talk Cyber CNI FR, your monthly cybersecurity speaker series. As usual, we want to highlight a topic around cybersecurity today, one of the most exciting and important topics uh, we currently have in our digital world. And uh, today I'm very, very happy to welcome Guillaume Neo from uh, Amazon Web Services in France. Uh, with Guillaume, uh, we're working for quite a while already. We did uh, quite some cool stuff uh, with these summer schools, future IoT summer schools and uh, other things. And maybe in the future we'll have even more uh, collaboration. And uh, it's always a great pleasure working with Guillaume. And uh, you will see that he's a real treasure of knowledge uh, around the topic of today, securing the cloud, encryption and data protection. But he has many more areas that are super exciting and super interesting. As usual, we have our second screen today, so I uh, show it to you on the left. So we have the Slido, and as it's the 26th edition, the code for today is CyberCNI-26. You can also scan the code here. Um, we also put it for you in the chat, and it will also be shown uh, at the side uh, of the interface, uh, so at uh, this uh, side of the interface. Um, of the screen. Uh, I will also show you the, the shortcut and uh, as usual it makes a lot of sense to join the second screen because not only you can put your questions there but you can also see the questions of the other people. You can uh, discuss with us live. The organization will be as usual so we'll have about 45 minutes time for the presentation of Guillaume and then we'll have everything up to 90 minutes then for a discussion around these questions. We'll have uh, Lloyd Miller joining us today for helping me moderating these questions. And uh, both parts are super interesting and uh, different. And uh, therefore, yeah, really ask your questions. We're looking forward to it already. And uh, we'll come to that in the second part. So I don't want to take too much uh, of Guillaume's time uh, for this introduction. So I will briefly introduce him and then I will hand over to him. So Guillaume is a senior solutions architect with a specialization in information security and work for Amazon Web Services in, Fri Web Service in France. In his day-to-day -day job, Guillaume advises customers about the information technology and security strategy as well as partner with operational team to design scalable, resilient and secure information systems. Guillaume is passionate about information technology for the positive impact it can have on people's life and the societal challenge chain changes and challenges definitely also that it drives and uh, today's topic as you have seen is uh, securing the cloud a super important topic because uh, most of the services that you are using on a daily basis are running in the cloud amazon web services is the biggest uh, cloud service provider and uh, therefore super important and super hot topic and uh, without further ado, Guillaume, I hand over to you for your presentation and uh, we'll see each other then afterwards for the discussion. The floor is yours. Well, uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mark Oliver. It's always an honor to have this opportunity to, to speak and to evangelize people about information security and, and cloud uh, technology. So today we really have one topic that I want to talk and, and discuss. It's uh, how cloud technology are transforming information security for the better. And really, I want you today to meet the AWS cloud and our culture when it comes down to information security and uh, the public cloud. Then we will have a focus on what transformation 
is the adoption of public cloud bringing when it comes down to our information security field. And then we will dive deep into how our encryption is deployed and what are the opportunity when it comes down to data protections uh, within uh, public cloud platforms. So the very first thing that I want to cover with you, uh, and it's it's really his an anecdote, because when you have this talk with enterprise clients and with the C suites, uh, I often ask them, do you know about Log4G? And the answer is often no, they are not aware. And here at AWS, uh, our most senior executive uh, are knowledgeable about Log4G. Why? Because we have this culture at AWS that security is the top priority and that everyone is responsible for it. We understand that the very notion of public clouds uh, relies on trust and on information security because no customer ever wants its data uh, to be accessed by an uh, a malicious third party. So. Having a platform that is secure by design and having people that are highly empowered toward information security is a strategic asset and is absolutely fundamental when you provide cloud uh, services. The other things regarding Log4G is that within the disclosure and the report of the vulnerability, we have been able to patch it across all our environment services and customers uh, in less than 36 hours. And when you look at the scale of, of AWS, it is absolutely mind blowing. So meet the AWS cloud. When you look at our own definition of what the cloud is, it is the on-demand uh, on demand delivery of IT services according to a pay-as-you-go model. And when you zoom in what AWS is as of today, we are capitalizing more than 16 years of experience. We are providing more than 200 on-demand services that are building blocks for information systems. We are serving uh, more than 6,500 uh, 6, public institutions, sometimes operating really critical and confidential workloads. We are available uh, worldwide and our presence in Europe is as follows. We, we have eight regions in Europe on top of a global presence. I was referring at our service offerings as building block, where there it is, we are covering all the key components of IT system, from analytics, uh, DevOps, IoT, machine learning, and infrastructure, of course. The thing that is absolutely critical is every single service of AWS has built in a security component so that it is easier to deploy secure service and architecture in the cloud. Then, and we are going to start uh, seeing the first paradigm shift that the public cloud is bringing. The thing is, when you build in the cloud, we solution architect often tell our client to think services rather than uh, virtual machine and capacity. Well, this is absolutely the same in the cloud. As they are thinking, I need to encrypt something, you will turn and think, I need a service to manage the encryptions over my, my operation. And that is it. This security service, we have divided them into six fundamental categories from identity management to compliance with detective control, infrastructure protection, data protection, and incident response. And what they bring is they are bringing, let's say, advanced capability with a configuration that falls within the scope of a few clicks, removing the need for uh, expert knowledge and making information security more accessible to everyone. So now let's dive, deep, let's dive deep into what information security is in the cloud and really how to approach it. So the first thing is you really need to understand what we call the cloud security model and it goes like this. AWS is responsible for the security of the cloud and you really need to think of uh, the infrastructure, which is the physical data center, the physical uh, host that uh, on top of which you are going to deploy and, and, and build. But our customers are responsible for the security in the cloud. And that means that your data will always remain yours and we don't have any access. And this is, this is absolutely fundamental. The way 
you assess or the way we communicate on the secure on the security posture of the cloud is via different uh, compliance program for you that are probably interested in how does that translate or transpose to the European context? The first thing is we are fully compliant with the GDPR and we provide transparency over our uh, supply chain uh, outsourcing when that is the case. We have a presence in France, of course. We are fully compliant with the Hébergeur de Données de Santé uh, French security frameworks. And what is really interesting is when you choose to build on top of AWS, you directly inherit from more than 50 global industry certification and more than hundreds of local security accreditation. And you really need to, to, to see that in the perspective of uh, a very small business that needs to achieve, for example, the ISO 27001 uh, certification. Uh, it's an invest it's, it is an investment for it. And the thing is, we are removing the needs uh, for this small business to invest heavily to attain the certification, or at least we remain part of the investment that is needed. Then when you choose to build on AWS, you have access to dedicated security team 24-7, 24-7 uh, hours, 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year without paying any premium. It is completely included into the consumption of the service. And of course, you benefit from our experience running operation at scale. When you look at it from an availability perspective, uh, what the public cloud is bringing as well as a padding shift is how easy it is to create a resilient and highly available uh, service. Usually in the old world, when you were to tackle this issue, you would often uh, define uh, un plan de continuité activité et un plan de reprise uh, d'activité based on scenarios that you would define. The thing is, because a given region, which is a uh, geographic presence of AWS, is made by default of at least three availability zones that are collections of multiple data centers. Um, scenarios that would trigger your business continuity plan uh, are scenarios that are going to be fully transparent uh, within AWS. And once again, what we are changing is if you were to have, let's say, a system that would be deployed on two sites for resiliency purposes, you would have to make the, invest, the, capit the capital investments to build the second site, and then the engineering to deploy your information system on two sites for it to be resilient. The thing is with AWS deploying on multiple sites and having system automatically fail over from one site to another is only one click away and one configuration away when you are building it. And that is really game changing when it comes down to resiliency. Uh, all right, so what we have seen is you need to understand the uh, shared responsibility model, but you also need to understand that given the breadth of our services, this model is highly flexible and you can choose what part of your information security you are going to delegate to your, inform to your cloud service uh, provider. When you look at the service Amazon EC2, uh, which is a service that is that allow you to consume virtual machines. Amazon EC2, well, we are going to manage the hardware and on top of the AWS global infrastructure and the compute, storage, and database network. But you will be then responsible for the, dat the clients, the data that you are going to consume within the machines, the potential client-side encryption that you are going to develop, the network uh, and traffic inspection that you are going to send to the machine. When you look at container managed services, well, you can delegate more and more to AWS to benefit from uh, our teams and operation at scale. This also brings another transformation because when you look at information security from an enterprise perspective, you used to need to create your own departments, hire niche experts uh, in every single domain of information security for you to be able to cover all the case uh, that would surface. Here, for example, you can take your enterprise architect and say, look, uh, 
the decisions that you are going to make designing information system are going to have an impact in information security. And if you are able to identify a given domain in which you have a lack of skills, you can choose to actually uh, consume more managed services or serverless services for you to alleviate or for you to delegate the heavy lifting of information security to your cloud service provider, in our case, AWS. So when you look at it, uh, the field of information security, this is how we are really transforming it. So first of all, information security requires skills. And the thing is, information security in the cloud is all about integrations. It is no longer uh, about having the right knowledge, having spending years in, in the field. It is fully about uh, if I want to deploy an encryption project, I only need to select the correct options and I am done. The cloud provider is, is managing the rest. Specifically speaking about encryptions, uh, for those of you that are already managed such projects, an encryption project goes from the identification and the purchasing of the hardware security module to their deployment, to their integrations within uh, projects, uh, within projects. And here, what I'm saying is that the, both the selections, deployment, integration, and maintenance of these encryption capabilities are going to be fully managed within AWS. So information security is hard to assess and to maintain. The thing is, once again, historically speaking, you would often run security program at the enterprise level. But then after the program is run, you would often wonder in what state uh, your information system is and how to assess that no breaches as surfaces over the years. This again, uh, AWS provides ext uh, extreme visibility on your infrastructure so that you always know what configuration is deployed on one component, on what component of your information system. And then managed services automate uh, the application of security patching. This is historically a revolution because when you look at the ransomware that uh, that had a large impact uh, in different industry. They all came from vulnerability that had patched being released by the software editor beforehand. So that's the organization that currently were hit and suffered some downtimes uh, could have benefited from automated patching to prevent the occurrence of such events. And then you have information security requires investments. Basically speaking, as the industry evolved uh, quickly, you always need to keep yourself up to date and to look at integrating new information security capability. The thing with AWS is that we are managing this uh, innovation race for you. When we release a service, it is ready to be integrated within your information system within a few clicks. And we have a very large network of uh, software partners that are that are also very well integrated with uh, AWS services. And once again, you only have, a uni you only have one uh, focal point on which you have, you only have one focal, focal point that you have to look after. So some paradigm shift from the on-premises uh, traditional model when you look at information security in the cloud. Uh, AWS operates uh, its identity and access management model according to an implicit denied model. So everything is denied by default within AWS until it is explicitly written and allowed when managing principle. We have extremely durable and resilient services. For example, uh, Amazon Simple Storage, which is a file storage system, is made for 11 ninths of durability. Uh, we have a systematization of encryption and secrecy, and we are going to dive deep on that uh, later on. And it is a favorable ground for automation. This is amazing as well. These are uh, also other examples of what we are changing and how easy it is to deploy these security concepts within the cloud. One of my favorite is the ease of segregation with the use of infrastructure as code. So it is very easy to create a micro network to prevent lateralization of threat actor in the cloud because uh, it is easier to manage complex architecture with infrastructure as code within AWS. So 
Now we are going to look after what data protection is, what encryption capabilities we provide, and how if you are, let's say, a searcher or within a research and development entity, you can potentially be interested, we can probably be interested in the different confidential computing capabilities that we offer. So when you look at the data lifecycle, uh, a given data, it goes from its creations, storage, processing, archiving, up until its operations. And the thing is, your data needs to be secure at every stage of its life, from its creations to its operations. There is different security framework within the industry that covers every single step of these life cycles, and we are going to cover storage, mostly storage and processing today. Once again, if you look at uh, what a data is and in what state, we usually speak or consider three states of the data. There is data at rest, data in transit, and data in processing. And these are the different security mechanisms that you can deploy to improve the confidentiality of your data. So if you look at data at rest, encryption, of course, but also access control, the durability of the data, uh, deploying data loss prevention system, integrated check, and of course, secure deletions. When you look at data in transit, of course, secure communications via the use of encryption is uh, by default standard, but you also have authentications and authenticity check and filtering of the data to present, for example, fault injection, uh, fuzzing, uh, yeah, fault injection and, uh, and fudging and even denial of service. When you look at data in processing, uh, the thing is homomorphic encryption is not yet widespread, but yet we are seeing more and more encryption, memory encryption capability uh, made available via different uh, processors. We do support some of them. We do also provide our own uh, solution, but usually and traditionally, this issue has been uh, tackled or addressed via uh, isolation of process. So now let's say you have deployed an information system in the cloud and you really want to work on the confidentiality of the data that you are processing so that the cloud provider or an external actor doesn't have any chance of accessing it. So the thing is, from left to right, what we have. So on the left side is, let's say, a web application or you that is uh, uploading a PDF file to AWS. So what we have is you, you can encrypt the communication channel. So usually it's going to be done via HTTPS. And if you want to encrypt the metadata of HTTPS, of course, you can do HTTPS over an IPsec uh, VPN. So that sits the encryption of the communication mean. You can encrypt uh, your data in that channel to add an extra layer of confidentiality. And then you can process this data on a virtual machine that has memory encryption enabled and then store it within a volume that is going to be further encrypted. And you can, of course, if we are looking at database, relies on the traditional confident, uh, traditional protection mechanisms from uh, SQLs and giants like table encryption and volume encryption that are part of transparent of TDE, which is transparent encryptions. So we really have this continuum and you really have this continuum as an opportunity to deploy encryption in the cloud. Yet, one of the things that you can wonder is deploying encryption over each of these channels is going to be extremely complex. Yes, it would if you were not operating in the cloud. If you operate in the cloud, most of it is fully automated and integrated, and we are going to see how. So first of all, let's have a look at the encryption capabilities that we provide and that integrates fully with the, with, uh, the AWS services palette. So we have AWS KMS, which can be seen as a pooled and managed encryption solutions. We have AWS Cloud HSM, which is a dedicated encryption solutions. We have AWS external key stores that has been uh, announced at AWS reInvent this last November that provide external encryption solutions. And then we have AWS Certificate Manager to uh, provisions or synchronize with uh, certificates for secure protocol. When you look at the differences between these services, 
it is mostly about the level of trust and the level of control that you have and can have on uh, the keys that are going to use that are going to be used to provision data key or uh, that are going to provision data key to then perform enveloped uh, encryption. And the thing is, or what's the takeaway? What what the key takeaway is, is you can you, you have a lot of opportunity and you can do pretty much uh, you can deploy pretty much the flavor of encryption that suits your operation best uh, from having key fully managed uh, by aws at the cost of zero dollars to uh, having keys that you manage within hsm that you control and that are going to be uh, at your very own end the thing that i want to highlight is the more control you want to have on the key and the more, let's say, trust you don't want to delegate to AWS, the more cost and complexity you are going to introduce uh, within your uh, information system. And this, of course, as a trade-off, because if you are not able to perfectly manage your cryptographic operation, then you are increasing the probability of your cryptographic deployment being compromised and then your data to be potentially accessed by someone else. So really here, is, so really here you need to really consider this trade-off of, I want to have full control over my encryption capability, but I probably need to hire and train engineer for that to be able to be done, or I want my encryption capability to be managed so that I know, so that I know that I have deployed encryption according to state of the art, uh, state-of-the-art uh, recommendations. All right, now to better understand uh, the challenges often associated to encryptions, uh, we have the deployment of the key, the protection of the key. We have keys that are used in the field that are sometimes reused and we don't have much control. And then of course, you need to think of, about the storage and the confidentiality of the master key and potential backup of it. Uh, and then when you look at encryption, it can be done both uh, client side and, and server side. Uh, these are challenges that we solve we are our, with our encryption services. Uh, essentially, when you look at AWS KMS, when you provision the keys that is going to then uh, provide data key to services, um, AWS KMS manage the key hierarchy, manage the rotation of the key, manage the backup uh, of the keys, and it's only a few click away uh, to really have an infrastructure that could probably cost thousands of euros of investments uh, if you were to do it yourself. So uh, regarding encryption, how it's done within AWS, so we have our encryption service uh, speaking for K AWS KMS on top and for Cloud HSM uh, bottom. Uh, when you look at KMS, uh, we have a master key that will never leave uh, the hardware security module. This master key will uh, derive what we call data key to perform envelope encryption that is then going to be used uh, to encrypt the data. And then the data, the data key that is used to encrypt the data is going to be encrypted itself uh, within the metadata of the data for decryption purposes, of course. When you look at how it's done within Cloud HSM, uh, we use a PKCS 11 standard. And then what you can do is you create a secure link with Cloud HSM, you perform your cryptographic operation, and you return the result of it. As it is, uh, well, slightly longer from a performance point of view, this is not very often used, or if it's used, it is only for very sensitive data. All right, now let's say you want to deploy encryptions within your information system. So how are you going to put that in practice? So on the left side, you have the manage uh, part and vision of AWS, which is you have one service that natively integrates with everything from database to file storage to message bus. And really, here you create your let's say uh, storage space. You click on the option, you select the options that you want your storage space to be encrypted, and then your storage space is going to be natively encrypted by AWS, and we will manage uh, the key and the encryption applied to the object. Uh, 
If you want to, let's say, encrypt the PDF that we have identified in the former schema, well, we provide we provide software component in the form of SDK. And the thing is, you are going to use the SDK to ask for a data key, uh, uh, to ask for the data key uh, to uh, AWS KMS or encryption service. KMS is going to return you a data key that you are going to then use via the SDK, which is uh, our implementations of the different cryptographic uh, algorithms. And then you will have your data encrypted. If you don't want to use the SDK from AWS because you don't trust uh, our own implementation and it is open source, by the way, well, you can still use uh, our SDK or make HTTP call natively towards the AWS services. So AWS services is going to return you a data key that is going to still be backed by an AWS cryptographic services. And from this, you can use OpenSSL and perform your encryption with a data key that you know is fully backed by cryptographic capability in the cloud. One thing that is really important to understand from a security point of view is that since you are using cloud native services, the authorizations model associated to the consumptions and the solicitation of the keys is uh, tightly coupled to the IAM model that is deployed in the cloud to, so that you uh, need to take care of the identity principle that you are using to make the API call towards the uh, KMS services. So if we dive deep on how encryption is performed and the cinematics that you need to implement to encrypt data using a cryptographic service in the cloud, but this is really in depth. So the thing is, uh, so on the left is the encryption part. So you have your SDK, you are going to call the general, the generate data key uh, of KMS that is going to return you a data key. You have your plain text and then the SDK is going to uh, return you the cipher text containing your PDF that has been encrypted with the data key. And then we have an encryption of the data key here that is performed by KMS. When you want to decrypt, well, you take the metadata, you ask KMS to perform the decryptions on the metadata and to return you the key. And then you use the plain text version of the key to then decrypt uh, the cipher text of the PDF and you're good to go. Uh, one thing that is interesting, it, this is the type of operation that you would have to manage if you were to deploy encryption yourself, specifically speaking of the case of client-side encryptions. The thing is, because you are in the cloud, this process is managed, uh, is automatically managed by our uh, AWS services. Here again, I'm going to use Amazon S3, which is our file storage services. And this is basically what Amazon S3 is doing. You deliver your plain text data to Amazon S3. Amazon S3 ask uh, KMS to provide a data key. The data key is returned to S3 and S3 automatically encrypts your data according to the encryption flow that I just described. When you perform the, the, the when you want to perform the decryptions, the decryptions of your object, well, Amazon S3 um, take your encrypted data in the storage. It asks uh, for the encrypted data key. The data key is returned to Amazon S3 and then it returns you the decrypted data. And that is it for encryptions. Now, and to, to conclude this uh, presentation, and that would have been 40 minutes, so that is perfect. Um, to conclude this presentation, I want to bring our confidential computing in front of you. So the thing is, the way we approach confidential computing is basically we identify two distinct uh, perimeters. A first perimeter that uh, is between the cloud provider and the information system of our customer. And the second provider, and the second perimeter, sorry, that is in between a customer's uh, information systems. So the thing is, to address the perimeter one, uh, which means between the cloud provider and a customer information system, it really is about relying on the virtualization capacity of the hypervisor. And our first answer to this issue is the Nitro card. And essentially, Nitro is a proprietary hardware developed by AWS that is responsible for the virtualization process. Uh, it is a result of 
uh, more than 10 years of trying to address this issue of we don't want to be knowledgeable about customer data and we need to optimize uh, virtualization because this is at the very root of being a cloud, uh, of being a cloud provider. And this chip is essentially responsible for the hypervisions. When you look then at security enclave, which is essentially our answer to uh, perimeter two, which is within your information system, you want to have uh, an extra level of confidentiality. Thing is, you can provision what we call a nitro enclave, uh, which is going to be a next, which can be seen as an extra virtual machine that is virtualized by Nitro and associated to a given virtual machine so that you cannot enter the virtual enclave. The only means of communication that is available is via its parent instance and, vir and virtual uh, socket. The enclave itself is immutable, which is the code that you deploy cannot be changed and no one can access or read it. The enclave is cryptographically signed so that you can uh, read and attest uh, its identity and, and provenance. And, and that is really uh, and that is really exciting because we are seeing application of it to protect, for example, intellectual property. Uh, and I'm going to, to give you an example. So let's say you are a scientific organization. You have engineered a very, let's say, confidential algorithms that is providing you a competitive advantage in your industry. And you want to deploy your algorithms and software within your clients. The thing is, going into productions and deploying your model within client's environment, put it at risk of being stolen, reverse engineered, and then all your advantage, all the hard work that you have put in your research and development is going to be gone in no time. So the thing is, you could put on, use Secure and Clive powered by AWS to deploy your intellectual property and then consume data from your customer. The thing is, your customer cannot access your algorithms and you, can, you are still able to perform the uh, specific computations that you want. All right, so that brings us to the conclusion of this, of this talk. And then we, I'm happy to take uh, questions and, and elaborate on, on what has been said. So the conclusion is, well, the AWS cloud is on demand delivery of IT resource with pay as you go uh, pricing. Uh, no license, no engagement. Uh, if you want to try something, you can. The very seconds you delayed the resource, you are no longer charged for it. Uh, according to the shared responsibility model, you can delegate the heavy lifting of information security to AWS by strategically deciding to use managed service or uh, manage our serverless services. And this is effectively bridging information security and enterprise arch architecture together for the better, uh, hopefully. You can build resilient application infrastructure by leveraging AWS global infrastructure, essentially scenarios that use to trigger business continuity uh, plan are today trivial within AWS and no longer even some things to be worried about. Uh, then it is easier to build secure information system on AWS, uh, well, secure and confidential system on AWS. Uh, service offer built-in encryptions, backup, patching, observability, filtering, and uh, authentications uh, that are easy to deploy uh, with only a few uh, clicks. Uh, and that is it uh, for me. I hope you found it interesting. I hope you will soon be a customer of AWS. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, I, I always answer it. I'm available uh, on LinkedIn, generally speaking. And, and that is it for me. I can hear you.
this is the problem. Sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so now now we're in the question. So sorry for that. I was uh, was not transitioning to the to the right screen. So yeah, once again, so I was just thanking Guillaume and uh, I was telling him it was a great uh, presentation that is really was really covering a nice uh, spectrum of uh, security features. And uh, we have more than uh, 20, 30 questions in the chat, which is quite cool. It shows, I know okay. it's coming. Now, now we're in the question. Okay. Um, which shows that you're very interested in uh, the topic, which is quite good because as I said at the beginning, cloud is uh, where most of our services are running. And so as usual, I want to start with the first question and uh, I already asked Guillaume, but you didn't hear it, so I asked the question again. So Guillaume was presenting a lot of um, backbone, backend services that people can compose um, to offer their service and uh, Amazon can take care of the security by design for this part of the service. But of course, there's also client code and the service uh, that cannot only cons or might consist sometimes of only composing AWS services, but uh, often there's probably also a customer part uh, that is code that is not written by AWS uh, engineers. And uh, therefore, my first question is, how does AWS uh, work uh, at this interplay? How is there something how you can secure that uh, the overall service that depends on the security of both um, is really secure? Um, all right, yeah, I, I don't have all the I don't have all the answer, but it is uh, it, it is really uh, it, it is really interesting. So uh, regarding this. Um, yeah, so regarding this, I want you to picture the shared responsibility model, which is AWS, we are responsible for providing infrastructures and whatever is deployed on our infrastructure falls on your side of the security model. So in that, uh, in that particular question, the thing is, you take a virtual machine that is on AWS and our, let's say, responsibility part is to be sure that this machine cannot be accessed from, let's say, third party that are clients of AWS, but that want to connect to your machine to steal its data and, and, and potential property. Our part of the responsibility is to be sure that your machines have access to a network that is uh, protected and that you can deploy whatever security mechanisms that you want on your machine. Uh, a fantastic things that we have solved when you look at it from an information security perspective uh, is Obviously, we are completely ignorant of what is deployed on the virtual machine. So if you deploy a code uh, that is vulnerable by default, well, of course, someone is going to enter your machine that you pay and run whatever processes they want. For example, uh, let's say Bitcoin mining that you are going to, going to be charged for. But let's have, uh, um, let's have a look at what if your code is compromised, someone enter your machine and deploy a ransomware. If you were to be, if you were not to be on AWS, this could be an issue, because within your own data center that doesn't provide the same segregation capabilities, and the ransomware would spread, and every information system that is deployed within your data center would be impacted. Uh, a thing that AWS has solved by re-engineering its networking uh, processing, by re-engineering its virtualization capability, and by re-engineering the way our machines are, let's say. Uh, uh, deployed within our data center that we have solved this fundamental issue. So the thing is, we had to deploy it and we had to engineer our service offering and infrastructure by factoring this risk that we don't have any control over what is deployed on our infrastructure and that even if something is compromised within our infrastructure, it should not impact uh, the rest of our clients. So yes, so the answer is quite complex than in depth if you want to look at the engineering because we will have to cover networking, encryption, virtualizations, uh, and, and a lot of topic. And I'm not an expert in everything that we have done within AWS. I try to focus on what is happening in the cloud and how you should engineer your uh, information system. But this is uh, this is the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, very very good. Um, and uh, I will. Uh, I want to ask a uh, second uh, related question, which is: um, when you develop software, you uh, have different design decisions, and uh, one decision is if you um, uh, rather create um, uh, stateful or stateless services, and. Um, 
I would be interested in anything you can say to that, but concrete questions would be like, um, did AWS shift the customers towards doing the one or the other? And um, would you recommend one of the two? Which models does uh, AWS support best? Uh, but I, I'm also open to any comments uh, that, that you have to that because I think that's quite an interesting uh, point. Oh, it's, uh, then I have a, a huge responsibility then. Uh, <laughs> well, the thing is, uh, I think personally i very personally think as a software engineer that stateless is the way to go because essentially it is more scalable uh transactions are more atomic and it's easier to track wh what is going on whereas if you have a system that is stateful uh if ever something goes bad then you need to recreate the course of events that made your system to fall back and sometimes because you lack observability it is not reproducible so yes, from an engineering perspective, uh, I like stateless the most. From an AWS perspective, we consider that we don't have, uh, we, we don't really have to advise our clients which type of engineering is uh, best for them. But the thing is, uh, when you look at the type of trainings and, and guidance that we provide, uh, we, we tend to hugely favor uh, stateless transactions and, uh, uh, and services. Uh, then when you, when you look at uh, design perspective, and uh, I want to slightly go back to the previous questions, um, the way you can build on AWS and the, the way you write software. So let's say you want to create an API, uh, an API that then save a data within the database. So it's a very standard piece of code. And the thing is, when you look at the software stacks that you're going to write and deploy, you are going to write uh, code that is going to be responsible for the API. You are going to write code that is responsible for the business logic, and then probably you are going to deploy your database and write code that is responsible for interacting with this database. The thing is, if you have ownership on every single layer of your information system that I just described, you can introduce vulnerability at every single layer. Uh, what's the cloud? The opportunity that lies in the cloud is, for example, the API layer, you can delegate to AWS and say, look, I am going to consume a managed service of AWS that is already providing me the API layer. For the business logic, you can say, look, I am going to uh, provision the very strict minimum that I need to execute my business logic uh, and then delegate the infrastructure to AWS and same goes for the database. So by writing your software like this, or by syncing your software cloud first, you are minimizing your attack surface, and that is how you do, uh, and that is really how you do uh, information security. And then you can do DevSecOps and uh, some sanitization check on your software, but that is really how you, you do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and regarding stateful and stateless, yeah, my, my personal preference is really um, go stateless because it is more atomic, it is easier to establish observability. Uh, if you were to do uh, <clears throat> forensic after uh, an event from an information security standpoint, it is easier to understand what went through. And if you were to recreate, let's say you you need to provide proof that someone compromises your instances in front of um, uh, a judiciary system, because you have to actually establish a legal proof for someone to be prosecuted, then it is much, much, much easier to be done than having to recreate a convoluted uh, state of a given national database and said, look, uh, we were at that state, which can potentially incriminate a dozen of actors and not uh, the ones that you are potentially prosecuting. And so, yes, stateless is probably the way to go. Mm -hmm. Okay, very, very interesting. Uh, so the audience, you see again uh, the link uh, on the side. So if you have some more, more uh, questions to ask, do not hesitate to enter them. And before I give over to Loic, I have a last thing that I want to ask now because it fits very well in the flow, um, which is um, updates. And um, the first question I would have there is, uh, what is the biggest uptime of a service in AWS? Or to formulate the question differently, do you have services like the Amazon Shop uh, Web Frontend or something that have a huge uptime because you somehow manage to do backend updates while the service keeps running? Or is it like you have regular downtimes? Um, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. So how big it's a fantastic topic, uh, both from an operational standpoint and an information security standpoint. Uh, I know way too little from the operational standpoint. I know a bit on the information security part. So the bottom line of it, um, 
AWS is divided into two big components, the control plane and the data plane. The thing is, the control plane doesn't necessarily need to be available. Uh, like it, it, it isn't like new, we are not talking about nuclear grade uh, yeah. availability principle. And the proof of that is once you are created your virtual machine, what you want is your virtual machine to be available. If you need at some point to shut down your virtual machine, it is less critical if let's say you suffer three minutes downtime on this uh, um, on this call, then your virtual machine actually not being available. Well, this is this is an example. Uh, regarding our SLA, well, we I think the warning that we have is we try everything that is commercially vi viable to provide the best uh, availability to our customer. Um, this directly translate to SLA on which. Uh, this is actually translate to SLA. Uh, yeah, and, and that is uh, from an operational standpoint. The way we 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 approach uh, patching is we try to make them transparent for our customer, uh, especially security <laughs> patching. So we usually we heavily relies on uh, blue green deployment, which is at some point we are going to deploy a sister services that is going to have another configuration, and then we are going slowly and gradually shift the traffic to these services so that it is transparent for the end user. Mm -hmm. And do you also force customers to update their code um, uh, slash uh, what is the oldest uh, service that is running? If you have any guesses there, is there some services from... Uh... Oh. So there is, okay, so, so the thing is, and I really want to stress that we don't have any visibility on the code that runs on AWS. So if a customer has vulnerable codes and, he, and if the customer isn't consuming security service that explicitly scans his codes, we, we have no way to know that, looks, your code is vulnerable, maybe you should be doing something about it. Uh, on the other hand, the answer to your question is what's the oldest service or what is the longest running instance of AWS? Uh, this might not be the best answers, but I know that we have customers that have been running a classic versions of our virtual machine services, which is EC2 Classic. So we are talking of machine being up and running uh, since 2005, something like that. <laughs> that is a bit mind blowing, uh, and this, <laughs> on the contrary, we we are proactively reaching out to customer and say, look, uh, you are consuming a service that we wish we could retire. Mm -hmm. So could you please consider moving uh, out of it? But this is also highlighting one rule of AWS in that we are not pushing customer away of retired service against their will, which is if, if if at some point you still want to consume the EC2 uh, classic version because you think it fits your need, uh, the only thing that we can tell you is would you please gently adopt the mm -hmm. other service, but we won't retire it uh, mm -hmm. brutally. Mm -hmm. um, even though I said it was my last question, Loic, I hope you allow me to. Yeah, it's OK. okay. Go ahead. And, uh, which, which is very related to what you just said, namely, um, so you're probably providing the biggest uh, runtime environment for services worldwide, I would say. And um, so uh, you you certainly also have uh, something that maybe you call like that or don't call like that, like a supply chain, and especially like a software supply chain where you get in a product. I'm now thinking about a very uh, at hand things for website operators, like a new PHP version and so on. So how is the... Um, how is the interaction there with the uh, with the supply of updating open source products and so on and interacting with the community developing it or pushing into the development um, how do you keep track of uh, which parts of uh, software are integrated in your products do you have insights in that can you say a little bit um, something about that no this uh, this, this i don't know uh, about i know we have some content available on youtube about uh, reinventations of uh, open source sessions that i highly encourage you to see but this i'm really too far uh, too far away from to to, tell, to, to say something about it mm -hmm. okay cool uh, then i hand over to Loic. i have some more questions but i will show them in uh, once the opportunity comes okay okay thanks uh, thanks again for the very interesting talk uh, we have a lot of questions, so I think I'll just go ahead and pick the first ones I see. Uh, I see. I see a funny one, which is, uh, so the question is, currently GPT-3 is a hot service. 
I read it would cost 3 million euros to run the service. How difficult is it to implement such a service in a secure way? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Uh, there is too much complexity in, in running or engineering uh, AI services. Uh, I do have some bit of culture, to say the least, about uh, AI services, because you need to actually take care of the training. You need to then, after you have the training, you have the artifacts uh, of the trained models that you need to deploy, and then you need to deploy the model with virtual machines that have access to, to GPU. So. I did not have any cases of working on such a, a project. Uh, reading books and, and articles would push me in considering a lot of things. Uh, have let's say a very first step, which would be to build a, an efficient threat model of your project and what what you want to do. Uh, but I, I I don't know much about it. I, I have an article in the making that I'm trying to write with uh, colleagues from the uh, directory generate, uh, general directory for the armament in France, uh, but we are far from having, let's say, a consolidated, a consolidated, consolidated view uh, on the topic. So sorry about that, but <laughs> really, I don't know. It's a really specified questions. Uh, but ChatGPT is, is actually fantastic. And one thing that I can say on the service is uh, I, I, I do rely on it. Uh, sometimes when I want to challenge myself about uh, security questions that I receive from from customer, because they said, "Look, uh, I want to. I have this security uh, problem, Guillaume, and what are your recommendations?" So I make my recommendation first, and then sometimes I go within ChatGPT and I ask the question of the customer. And sometimes, uh, well, ChatGPT is right <laughs> uh, and makes uh, recommendations that are really really good. And so I, I'm, I'm happy that you say that because I was just thinking this is how you write your code now. You just no. put, I need something and then you take it and copy and paste it. No, 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 no. Um, the things that we have that we have tried when ChatGPT was first released is that we we were working uh, on purely internal projects, nothing related to to AWS services, but something that we were developing for uh, customers or so very specific pieces of codes. Uh, and the thing is, we were like, oh, how about uh, conducting the security review with uh, ChatGPT? So essentially, we went to the service and we say, look, uh, what are the potential security flow? We pasted the code. Well, hopefully nothing came up, <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> but, but, but it, it is interesting. Uh, I, I, really like, I really like the tool. Uh, I think it's the very first time that, I, that I'm actually impressed by uh, AI capabilities. It has definitely a lot of use when you apply it to information security, either if you have a sysadmin, a CISO, uh, a program manager, um, a compliance manager within your company. Uh, I highly encourage you sometimes to challenge yourself to the chat GPT test <laughs> and uh, see how it will approach the problem that you're really going to solve, that you are trying to solve. Yeah, and then to that a remark, because I was just reading about it, so <clears throat> OpenAI, they're working on watermarking the productions that they have, and uh, they do not necessarily want to watermark them in order to prevent plagiarism, like for uh, work at university and so on, but for something even more important, namely the corpus of data that is available today is uh, human, mainly, like it's either easily identifiable that it's machine generated or it's human generated. And as we have Jet GPT-3 now as the first massive text and information generator, a future problem would be or could be that in the future when you want to train an AI, it's quite difficult to find out which data was generated by the AI and which data is like native in quotation marks and uh, so th this was quite interesting to me to read because it really shows that we are on the transition point once again of data sources and so on but this just as a yes. side note for those uh, and there is uh, yes and th th definitely I, I think it's a, a google article that was uh, published if my memory is correct uh, another question that i have regarding this uh, which is more let's say information security oriented uh, when you look at it and when you look at the history of information security let's say before the before the year 2000 information security was something that was very uh, that was about secrecy the thing is if you wanted to secure a system because we don't have all the encryptions implementation that that we have now 
the best way to protect an information system and to present is to pretend it did not exist, to don't to not have access to its source codes, uh, IP addresses, and software that it runs. Then, over the course of the years, uh, and I say from the uh, from the year 2000 to 2020. We went the, the completely opposite direction, which is the more the information is accessible, the more it can be challenged, the more it can be challenged. So the more intelligence you put into the securing of a given information system. But the thing is, with the rising of ChatGPT, your attack surface is all of a sudden, let's say, exposed widely available. And the really breakpoints that I'm really questioning or I'm really curious about is. Uh, the thing that was preventing, the thing that was making open sourcing data not an issue is that you wouldn't have a single human being capable of aggregating all the information available and weaponizing it against your organization. But now with AI, the thing is you can potentially ask an AI to perform a scan on a given organization, find the vulnerability, craft your payload, and auto completely automate the chain of intrusions. So the thing is, we are probably we are probably going to witness another shift in our industry, where in which you will only publish false information about your information system to deceive uh, AI, and then you will fall back into uh, I, I need to keep my uh, code secret because mm -hmm. the very second it is made public, it is going to be trained, it is going to be used as a data point to be trained uh, by an AI and can be potentially weaponized against me. Mm -hmm. uh, very interesting. Yeah, I think that's that's very true. I, I think it's already been used, like in smart contracts on the blockchain, uh, with ChatGPT to to check for errors in the contract, <laughs> actually. And we yes. already had like things like adversarial machine learning and stuff like this. So it doesn't surprise me at all that we could see what you are saying uh, happen in the future. Yeah. yeah. The thing is, these concepts are, let's say, known to to people yeah. in the field of information security. What I find, what I think the breakthrough is, is with ChatGPT, we have a sound example of this being mm. uh, yeah. ready, already available. Um, okay, so maybe I'll go move on to the next question. Um, how did AWS change the software landscape? I am thinking about apps here, etc. Not sure I'm getting the question right. Yeah, uh, uh, the software landscape. Um, I guess what impact did AWS have on the uh, the software on the industry? On, yeah, on the software Probably, industry. Well, the, the question goes into the direction you have apps and um, uh, then you have uh, rich frameworks like AWS. Oh. They favor certain applications because they just support them. And uh, do you have the impression mm. that AWS? Um, like channels a little bit the developments in what you offer, or do you even counteract uh, to having such biasing effects and not limiting in quotation marks innovation? Um, all right. Uh, so, so the first thing is is really is we we consider that it is let's say our ethical work responsibility to uh, not influence our, our customer choice. So even if you make a bad decision, so I would say it's it's my responsibility to make the best out of a bad decision, no matter what I think of it from an engineering standpoint. Then from, let's say, a platform perspective, um, AWS is thought to be a platform that is widely open so that you have the least amount of constraints. And th that is really something that people don't realize and probably uh, that is inducing a bit of stress working in this industry because because AWS is as you is pay as you go IT delivering of services, uh, according to a pay as you go model, if at some point one of our customers want to go away from the platform, well, we have nothing to retain it. Uh, our CTO is really saying that you choose and stay on AWS for the value that we provide to your engineering team and not for the constraints that we are imposing to your organization. And, and that is really true. And that is true as well for uh, the software that are built and deployed uh, in AWS. Now, when you look at the impact that we have on the software landscape, well, the truth is we are all lazy at some point, uh, including developer. Uh, and when you look at developer and software engineer, uh, oftentimes when you speak with them, 
they really don't want to be bothered having to manage uh, infrastructures, which is having to manage the virtual machines that actually run their, their application code, they don't care. They want to focus on delivering value for their startups, uh, for their business, or for their, let's say, uh, pet projects that they are doing uh, in their garage. And, and, and that is it. So that is why really the impact that we have having on the software industry is that everyone is speaking of serverless or at least managed services, but because we are saving people an incredibly amount of time uh, when it comes down to application development. And then there is the information security perspective is that we are making application less error prone when they are developed in uh, a cloud native manner, which is absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. Like, 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 really picture it like this. You, you, you are an amateur developer. So you have a fantastic idea for your startups. And only by making these decisions of building serverless first, you have military grade security already built in, into your service mm. because you are consuming AWS uh, be, behind the scene. And, and that is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense to to take this approach if you want, like you said, to provide value immediately and not worry about underlying uh, constraints that you may have. Yes. And then let's say at some point your product has a fantastic traction. So you have this opportunity with, let's say, a governmental entity. The governmental entity is going to say, look, but what about the information security of your infrastructures? And the thing is, if if you have chosen to host it uh, the traditional way uh, in your garage because you are a small startup, <laughs> well, I think it's, it's almost impossible to say, oh, look, we are uh, resilient against DDoS. We mm -hmm. have, uh, let's say, fortified uh, access control in my garage because I want only uh, accredited personnel to actually have access to the, to the physical server rack. And this, you can say, oh, look, I, I am within AWS. So from an infrastructure standpoint, I'm clean. From a software uh, standpoint, well, this is something that I can work on definitely. Uh, if you purchase my service, then I can definitely hire someone and uh, be up to speed uh, within a few months. So, yes. Would, would you would you say in that um, context that AWS has um, strong advantages to other players because um, uh, many uh, or a big portion of the internet is hosted within your network, meaning that you have access uh, to the insights dot uh, following it a little bit like when you have a denial of service attack uh, you will see that multiple of your instances might be um, affected because you just have such a large um, source of heterogeneous services that are hosted with you so uh, is that something that you use is it something that you sell this intelligence this knowledge about the attacks do you offer an o'clock of um, so services for insights about that so, so, so first of all, and I really want to stress that everything that our customers do within AWS from a business perspective, from a data perspective is a nod to us, and we don't want to be knowledgeable about it. So yes, uh, some component of Twitter, Facebook, Netflix are hosted on AWS, that is true, but we don't have access to this data. We cannot commercialize it. We cannot uh, build intelligence on top of it. But don't you don't you have like the network intrusion detection in the sense that you can? I mean, you don't look. You don't do introspective into the services or even the machines. That I fully understand. But still, you see that uh, certain uh, classifiable uh, traffic is yep. routing to certain no, machines. No, no. When when you look at uh, when you look at threat intelligence and the, let's say, protections that we provide to our customer. Uh, the part that is true is, yes, we have dedicated uh, security team and threat intelligence team and, and security research team and, and, and everything. Uh, the way we make this threat intelligence and our observations available to our customer, because that is true that we capitalize on all this uh, traffic, uh, inbound traffic, I, I mean, uh, is we have different security services. And within these security services, we offer our customer to select a threat list or threat component uh, that are that result from this operation. So the thing is, if you look, if you look at it, let's say we have we witness a denial of service in, uh, in our region of Europe because one of our customers is actually a target. First thing is we are going to help and warn our customers that they are probably targeted uh, by a malicious entity and they can perform um, uh, X operations to actually mitigate the impact. Then from the IP list and the patterns that we see, we are going to hydrate 
uh, different files that are accessible to everyone. So if everyone wants to benefit from the same protection, it's only a matter of automation within AWS. You click on the button and all of a second, this list that we keep up to date uh, is is really is really is already there to to protect your services, mm -hmm. but then you need to deploy the edge service of AWS in front of your uh, of your workload, which is not already the case. Mm -hmm. uh, one one cool anecdote about that is well during the, the pandemic there was a lot of DDoS on let's say critical infrastructure in France. So uh, and I mean by that educational infrastructure and healthcare infrastructure, and we have been uh, solicited to actually help people uh, face denial of service. And this is what we have done, basically. We would have we, we have leveraged our edge service that we have put in front of traditional infrastructure to uh, mitigate a bit the DDoS uh, that they were suffering. Mm -hmm. OK, cool. OK, so maybe, uh, I see also something that is of interest to me in the questions. Uh, and perhaps I can fuse two questions together. Uh, the first one is, what is the role of quantum computing for AWS and its security? And the follow-up question, how post-quantum is AWS already? <laughs> this is a, good, mm. this is a very, very, very nice point. I should have mentioned it in my presentation. Uh, so first, first of all, and, and before we speak about quantum computing, because I often hear a lot of uh, FUD uh, on the topic, uh, I want to make a bit of, let's say, uh, well, I, I want to be, I, I want to recall the basic of, of data protection and encryption. So the thing is, data protection and encryptions, we all know how to reverse or perform cryptographic attack on the algorithms that we are using it. Either it is AES, either it is um, RSA. We already know how to revert and how to attack a data that is encrypted by it. The fact that makes these algorithms secure is that we have mathematically proven that your data is secure for 40 or 50 years. I, I, I can't remember. I think back back in 2010, it was 50 years with the current computing power. No, I think it's 40. So the thing is, when you actively encrypt a data using a, uh, AES-258, you know that your data won't be written for at least 40 years. So the thing is, if uh, I capture your data with, let's say, a network sniffer, I have your data, and in 40 years, I will be able to look into that packet and see what, what is happening. So when you look at quantum computing, the threat is your data might be readable within a time span that is less than 40 years. And the only question that matters with quantum computing uh, regarding confidentiality and encryption is, is this time span reduction actually dangerous for your operation? And more often than not, <laughs> the answer is no, <laughs> which is when you look at, for example, the legislations uh, for national uh, security, it, it essentially said, and I'm speaking of the US here, that something is national security for 50 years. After 50 years, it is public domain. Uh, and, and that is really mind blowing, because the thing is, we can we, we can now say that even the most sensitive information needs to be kept confidential for 50 years. After 50 years, we don't really care if they are public domain, so we don't even care of encrypting them and, and uh, of encrypting them. Now that is one extreme. So let's now uh, look at the other extreme. Let's say you are uh, a retailer and you want to perform a, a, a transactions uh, online. So the validity of the transaction is three seconds. Uh, after three seconds, and if this transaction cannot be replayed, you don't really care if the transaction is public. Well, of course, uh, we will be able to see uh, what kind of goods you have purchased, but is that really critical? And there, the answer is more often than not, not really. So, uh, so regarding quantum computing, uh, this is, let's say, the, the state of the art. No, how IWS is really regarding quantum computing? Well, of course, we provide one, what we think is quantum uh, what we think is quantum computing resistant cryptography and once again according to the paradigm that I just explained the aim of quantum uh, quantum computing ready cryptography is just to let's say increase the lifespan of the confidentiality of the data so that it is still 50 60 or whatever thousands of years you need uh, for to protect your data uh, 
Uh, and then, uh, so that is that is already the case. So I think it's mostly based on the elliptic curve, if my memory is correct. Uh, it is up to you to select these safer suites for your operation within AWS. The other thing that we are providing regarding quantum computing, I mean, the two other things that we are providing regarding quantum computing is we are providing a quantum enabled endpoint uh, that is fully transparent for you to use. This is the magic of, of, of AWS, to be honest with you. So you take the SDK, which is our software package to, enter, to send API call to AWS. And uh, if you select the option to use quantum enabled endpoint, you are going to use uh, the quantum key exchange uh, yeah, QKD, QKD, yeah, quantum key exchange uh, on AWS. This we already have uh, implemented. And then if you want to convey quantum research on AWS, which is the most fantastic part, to be honest with you, uh, we are providing a real quantum computing uh, capacity on AWS for you to train your algorithm or to find the implementation of the Shor algorithm that is eventually going to break RSA and NES. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, and then if you don't have the budget to really have access to a, a real quantum computing, I think we are uh, a leader in quantum simulation. So we provide also the quantum simulations uh, capacities. Mm -hmm. So this is things that you can do. <clears throat> Maybe let me bond with that. Um, uh, you were talking about quantum computers, which is dedicated hardware. So what is the role of dedicated hardware within AWS and towards um, the cybersecurity of the oh, of okay. AWS? Oh, maybe I, I wasn't clear enough. Uh, by dedicated hardware, I mean, uh, often when you look at what other cloud provider provides in the field of quantum computing, it is simulations. It is virtual, it is virtual qubits. Uh, we are providing uh, qubits mm -hmm. from quantum computing uh, computer. So that's what I meant. Yeah, sure. But I, like uh, independent of the quantum computing, it's uh, a la mode uh, now to have like dedicated uh, processors for data analytics and so on, uh, FPGAs and so on. Um, so when you, we come again now from a cybersecurity perspective, um, which role does do such dedicated so non x86 uh, risk uh, oh. standard in quotation marks processors play um, for the cybersecurity of the platform? Do you have some insights there? Nope. Okay, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> right. no. I, I I'm not working in the field of uh, building quantum computing. Oper I, I mean, think uh, I mean there, there are two sides. I mean, apply to quantum computing. I don't know because I'm I'm not uh, in depth enough into how quantum computers uh, are built. I I know the basics and fundamental, but not in depth to to speak about it. Uh, but when you look at from a security perspective, do you win? Uh, security property engineering your own processor, as, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this I would say that I don't have enough experience mm -hmm. to be an authority in the matter, but mm -hmm. I really don't see why it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, because wh when you look at it, when we say we at AWS, we are capitalizing on 60 years uh, of experience. These 16 years has made us available, uh, has, ma has made us ready to conceive and build uh, Nitro which is our virtualization cap capacity and on which uh, we are very confident that it is providing enough segregations uh, for us not to be able to access your data and for someone else that is a customer of AWS not to access your data uh, as well. So the thing is experience in, in a highly technical field actually matter because you have performed the already, you have performed the investments, you have potentially the people that have spent their life working on, on a topic and that cannot be thrown uh isn't cannot be thrown away but on the meantime when you are building something yourself the thing is you are you are effectively reinventing everything so you are potentially introducing new risk that you are uh, unaware of because it hasn't been peer reviewed uh, or you, you are just building things on flawed assumptions which is even more dramatic so mm -hmm. I, I don't see it as a fundamental security improvement building its own chips uh, but um, I mean this is a way of innovation the thing is you you try something new it is not perfect and then over the course of the years it matures and at some point the technology <clears throat> is there and ready for mass adoptions mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, like uh, another category there is also uh, dedicated uh, processing units for AI tasks. 
for uh, network stream analytics and so on, then I'm uh, quite sure that you also have such uh, things in your networks, um, but maybe you're not developing them yourself. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, then look back, uh, back to you. Okay, so maybe I think we have time for one more question, right? Yeah, yeah, we have yeah. time for two or yeah, three more questions, I would say. Two or three more questions? Seven, okay, seven okay, minutes. Good. It depends on the length of the answer. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see what is an interesting question. Um, oh, that's, that's uh, yeah. What is the role of DNS for cybersecurity? That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and to, to, to give you a background on that, so in the last two talks, um, we had uh, people from Twente and they were talking about DNS being a very uh, critical entry point for cybersecurity attacks. Uh, all right, so I, I'm nowhere near being an expert or an authority on, on, on DNS security. So I, I'm really going to talk about what I have witnessed uh the needs uh, of some customers that uh, I, i'm aware of and which we have developed custom solution for that so my very limited view is when you look at a, a cyber kill chain uh, more often than not the connection to uh, a command center or the downloading of the payloads uh, you or exfiltration of data sorry three things um, uses uh, the DNS protocol uh, because it is one of the protocols that is not monitored or filtered enough uh, within an enterprise network. So a lot of people uh, put a lot of barrier into filtering, I don't know, SQL, HTTP uh, protocol or, or other port. But the thing, because DNS is so critical within information system, it is often not supervised by uh, different network appliance. Uh, and, and that is really sad because this is often the protocol that is used in large scale and highly complex and highly elaborated uh, uh, attack. So from the AWS part, we actually have some things uh, to remediate this solution, which is the AWS uh, Route 53 DNS firewall. Uh, in, yeah. DNS firewall that you can enable so that all your DNS resolutions can actually be monitored and filtered. And this is, is this has proven to be useful many times for our customer. And then we had one of our customer in France that came to us and said, look, Guillaume, uh, this solution is nice, but we want to have more uh, control over the list of domains that we filter. Can you do something for us? And if you look at uh, our GitHub, uh, I have developed with some of my colleagues in France, we have developed a custom solution for that to filter DNS uh, call. So that is something that we do with an AWS when someone uh, come to our desk, uh, when the customer come to our desk and say, look, uh, I really like what you are doing, but uh, what do you think of this? Uh, particular issue, and then we take ownership on it, and we often uh, deliver a very specific package for that. So yeah. So how critical is DNS to information security at a global level? Well, I don't know, probably a lot. <laughs> <laughs> from my experience, uh, how critical is DNS security? Well, the thing is, if you want to prevent yourself from data exfiltration, uh, the, the downloading of payload or the communication with a command and center, this is definitely something that you should be implementing. But that comes into the category of, you, you should have some kinds of network filtering within your enterprise network, mm -hmm. and DNS yeah. should yeah. be a component of it. Mm. Very good. Maybe yeah. one more, Louis. Maybe one more. Um, oh, how do you interact with the research community? That's uh... <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm really sad because this is something that uh, I have been lacking, I think, through my career. So not much. Uh, I tried to read publication from the MISC and oftentimes we, we do have some really limited research uh, paper. Uh, but when I look at how I did interact with the research community, it was more when I was trying to really dive deep uh, into a topic. And then at some point when, when, when you just scroll through questions and, and, and you try to really ask yourself, do I have the correct understanding of this issue? Have I really considered all the possibility? But at some point you find a research paper on Google Scholar and you're like, oh, <laughs> I need to double check. Yeah. This is really an issue. Uh, but, the thing is, but the thing is, as an engineer, we are often way too far away from research. And the thing is, we have we really have issues that doesn't complement each other well. And I'm, always my definition of engineering is 
let's say, bringing uh, commercially viable solutions to realistic problems. And this is a lot of constraints. Because the thing mm. is, you, you have to bring a solution that is commercially viable, so you cannot over-engineer. Yeah. And then the issues mm. that you are trying to solve need to be realistic, which is if you ask me uh, today that you want a supercar to go to Venus, this is not engineering, <laughs> this is research. Yeah. Because the issues that you are uh, posing on the table is not realistic. Uh, so the thing is, by definition, engineering is a bit far away from research. Mm. Doesn't Amazon send some people though? Uh, I think being in the security uh, research fields, uh, sometimes I see uh, in like SNP or CCS conferences, the top conferences in secure in cyber security, yeah, some people. Uh, Oh yeah, yeah well, I mean, yes, we do have, but they work in other divisions of uh, of Amazon's uh, that is really dedicated to the research. The same way as we yeah. have organization really dedicated to open source, and the same way as we have organization really dedicated to support and, and everything. Uh, I am in an engineering sales uh, divisions, to be honest mm. with you. So I, I'm really far away from from their work. Uh, once a year, we do have a conference that gives me the opportunity to try to understand and, and comprehend what type of work they are doing. Uh, but the last time I did was on lattice-based encryptions for fully homomorphic scheme. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand everything. <laughs> yeah. I have to be honest. <laughs> Same. Yeah, no, no problem. Thank you for the talk and for the, uh, answering the questions. Well, maybe one last question, in which you can, uh, which is more general. And, and uh, with that question, I rather want to raise awareness that it's worth doing it. And the question is, um, how much would you say does AWS invest in cybersecurity? So is it the, and the answer? The, I don't need specifics, of course. But it's rather, um, I always tell the people you have to invest a significant amount of money into the, and resources into that because it's. If you don't use AWS, for instance, uh, and you don't have a huge so, security department, it will be difficult. If you use AWS, I, AWS with the security by design features, it might leverage your investments. But AWS itself, so how how much would you say you invest? Yeah, I, I have two. I have a two-sided answer to that. Uh, my, oh, I, I'm going to start with the industry standard. So the so industry standard is essentially saying that. 10% of your IT budget or IT consumption should be dedicated to information security. And truly, it, it has proven to be a good rule of thumb, which is you should be dedicating 10% of your time or 10% of the project time to information security, and you should be dedicating 10% of your budget uh, doing information security. And, and I think it's really the, the good rule of thumb. Uh, where does AWS come into place in these equations? Well, the thing is, if you manage your own infrastructures, you won't be going that far with this 10% of your IT budget dedicating to information security. Whereas if you are in the cloud, these 10% of your IT spends uh, are going to provide you probably uh, a lot of value from an information security perspective. Uh, then, and contrary to what you are speaking, uh, what you are telling Mark Oliver, my very, let's say, personal view on that, um, but that comes from the work that we have done uh, when I was working for the French government and working with the national agency uh, is I'd rather have organizations that said we don't do much about information security, but we acknowledge that it is a topic and we want to improve. So we want to instigate a positive dynamic, even if it is uh, something that is very small, rather than having organizations that don't do anything and said, look, we already have our compliance in place and compliance is uh, information security. Mm -hmm. So how much should you invest? And the, the answer is really, you, you should uh, invest as much as, uh, you, you should invest as much as not, uh, ah, you, you should invest in order to not disturb your, as much as you can in order to not dis, uh, disturb your operation. Mm -hmm. Because at the end, we, we need to be humble in the security field. We are not delivering functional value. We are a support functions of, of the business and, and we cannot demand uh, from the business to do information security. We have to provide them the solutions and we have to prove every day of being reliable business partner. So I'm like, 
how much should I invest? Well, how much do you want to invest? <laughs> 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 or how much can you invest? Yeah, and then no, it no, is no, my I, duty to make the most out of it. And I really, I really like your point. Like you should invest the most you can afford because, um, uh, and, and the other point that of course it's not providing a service. I mean, I agree with you, but at the same time, it's rather a yeah, negative service that is provided if it's not, if you don't have enough cybersecurity because the moment you have a ransomware attack, uh, you're out of business, uh, or like it's possible that you're out of business. But Very this, good. Very good. This, this, this yeah. is about being able to establish a, a trust discussion between a business decision maker and mm -hmm. senior security people, not, mm. not even leadership. The thing is, the premise of a healthy security relationship that we somehow managed to have in AWS is you sh it, it is our duty to make uh, information security risk understandable from the business leader. And then whatever resource they give, it is our responsibility to make the most out of it. Mm -hmm. And what's, once you are there, well, I mean, you're good to go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a very good uh, final uh, statement. So Loic, let's be the audience and clap <laughs> once again. Yeah. <laughs> Well, really great, great job. Um, I, I really enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, thanks, uh, thanks a lot. And I hope that we'll have the opportunity to to do more things uh, in the future. Um, so the uh, the next one, uh, the next uh, talk will be on the twenty fifth of uh, January, and I just redo with my computer, so I have to look up the exact title. So it's a French company, it's, they are called uh, Defense, and uh, they will be talking about it. And uh, let me have a look at the title. They will be talking about uh, the wrong uh, job. It's the semantic uh, system of investigation. Ah, yes, the semantic, yeah. semantic system security, exactly, because mm. the announcement is not online yet. So I will record the trailer on Monday, so it will be available on Monday. So 25th is the next edition. The recording of today's edition will stay online. If you did not subscribe to the channel yet, uh, do so. Subscribe to the mailing list on the website. And as usual, um, take care of your cybersecurity. Stay safe and uh, see you in uh, in two weeks. Thanks again, uh, Guillaume. And uh, those in the stream, you will see now the announcement for the next uh, talk and also the one of Guillaume and the outro. Thanks a lot for joining today and uh, stay safe. See you soon. Bye-bye. Cher cyber c'est un moule d'excellence région cyber. Bretagne. Au revoir et à la prochaine. Ouais.